Well, I think it's, we've, we've had 50 years of it, basically. So we've had some successes. I mean, this thing I've got on my uh, hand here, this is a calculational singularity to you and me. Uh, you know, like James Burke said, there's never been so much about which we know so little that's going on all around us. So this is uh, this has outcompeted me at my ability to do arithmetic. So this is a piece of a small piece of intelligence that has shot past human beings in a very specific module, right? Calculations, timekeeping. But we're getting more and more of those kinds of pieces. Some graduate student made a, maybe it was a 15 node neural net, something small, that actually was able to find supernovas in the night sky because it's an easy image recognition problem. It uh, gets white and then over a week or so it slowly fades off easy enough that a very simple program could be made to steer the, the uh, telescope. So now supernovas are not hunted for by human beings anymore. When you and I get, uh, use our credit cards, a neural net called Falcon, created by HNC, now Fair Isaac, um, this is a $100 million a year, $200 million a year program. It's a big, big project, a lot of people on it basically trains off of all your previous purchases so you go out and buy Pampers and you haven't bought them for 10 years that flags a human being but it's not a human that's looking at the primary data anymore and these are all pieces of AI that have outcompeted human beings in very specific areas these are very narrow. What about but Jeff? they're not they're, each, each of them are narrow but we have 50 years of these kinds of successes so we can show piece by piece by piece higher and higher order things. Now the ability to do visual recognition of faces, we're just on the edge of it. Some of the military systems, we're just on the edge of this kind of an HNC system that would flag something unique, pop it to a human, and then the human can train the net. Say, no, you're not looking for that, you're looking for something a little different. The one that I'm the most excited about is what I call a conversational interface. So you and I were using something called um, Alta Vista, pretty primitive search engine in 1998. The average query that we did to Alta Vista was 1.3 words. How long did it take for us to double our queries to 2.6 words? What do you think? Two years. It was seven years. So by 2003, the average query length was 2.3 words. Okay, how long, no, sorry, 2005. That's, that's seven years. How long is it going to take for the, for the next doubling to come? At, to come? Uh, in my essay, I went on record saying it's going to be seven years. Because what's actually happening, I think, is an exponential curve, which is basically code breaking. If you look at how code breaking works, when you're trying to figure out a foreign code, it goes on an S curve. So you get all the easy primers first, and then uh, it's hard to get the primers at the beginning because you don't really understand the system. And then you start getting them, and the more of them you get, there's this positive feedback loop. And then you figure out more and more about this foreign code you're trying to break. And then you reach the midpoint where you've got pretty much all the easy stuff that you need. And then there isn't so much more new stuff to get, and so then it starts to level out. So what I suggested is humans speaking to the web using sentences, whether they're typed or spoken, is actually on a code breaking function which means it's going to look exponential for the first few doublings. When you and I make a query to each other, the average qu sentence question is something like 11, 14 words. So I argued that we're going to go from 2.6 to 5.2 to 10.4, and that's 2019. Okay, 10.4. Now 2019, that's getting up to human level questions. But what I think is going to happen some, somewhere around 2019 is Every kid in the world is going to have a cell phone because they're going to be dirt cheap by then. Every kid in the world is going to be able to learn as fast as your curiosity drives them just talking to Google. Now that's really powerful. Right? Because Google got an optical cortex. Google's the fastest learning baby on the planet right now. Okay? It's the biggest, largest, most interesting word based and some images based web, right? It's really an intelligence, a primitive intelligence now. So because Google learned the word near, you and I can say coffee shops near Marina. Now that's four words, right? And you're gonna, the first link is going to be a bunch of pins that are centered around the downtown district of Marina or San Francisco or whatever. That's Google Maps.
So we've now been teased into four words. That's more than the current average, which is 3.5 words. Google's shortly going to learn time. So you're going to be able to ask Google a web, a web page that I heard that I saw a year ago, two years ago. And you're going to be able to say those words, and Google's going to be smart enough to go back to its database and give you only the time-based searches in its search relative to what you're looking for. So step by step, all of these companies that are using these new natural language processing tools for search are going to tease us into talking to our computers. What's exciting about that is once you're talking to a computer, you are going to want that computer to have a face. Because Bird Wistel showed in the 60s that two thirds of our information in face to face communication is nonverbal. You and I are nodding, nodding to each other right now, so I know I'm, I'm, I'm reaching you. If you weren't, I'd have to change what I'm saying. So it's incredibly efficient to be able to have verbal and nonverbal at the same time. So what I've just done is sold you a bill of goods. I've sold you on the idea that avatars become useful as soon as you have a conversational interface. Not just useful to you talking to the machine, to your car, to your house, to your robo kitchen, whatever, but you talking to other human beings through your avatar. I remember as a kid seeing Sagan's Cosmic Calendar and you look at, put all the interesting events on a calendar year and, you've, and, and all the interesting stuff happens after June, right? That's where, I mean, everything's so slow. You're creating galaxies, it takes forever. You're creating more complex galaxies. You first get the Earth-like planets right in the middle of the calendar year. And then what does it look like? The whole thing looks like a J-curve, the whole second half of the calendar year. Why is that? Why does all of the acceleration occur toward the very end? There's something about the universe that we live in that biases it towards acceleration of information. And you know what? Our physics textbooks don't talk about that. They tell us about statistical uh, second law of thermodynamics, statistical thermodynamics, right? That everything's running down, entropy's going up. But we know in our bones that life does the exact opposite. Life is ordering itself. Life is accelerating itself. So there's a piece of physics, there's a piece of philosophy, there's a piece even of some spirituality that's missing here, right? I, I would say most spiritual systems got that way before the, the scientists did, right? And now we're trying to figure out a way to reconverge science and spirituality into this realization that there's something about life something about this universe that is taking us to higher, more um, sublime levels. And, we, and there's good paths that we can make toward those things. Some people think it comes from the special structure of our universe, the way it's organized. So what we do is we throw all of our, every, every complex thing has to throw its trash away. And we throw all of our trash away, which is the heat out into the vacuum of space, which is the most efficient way to throw it away. So if we didn't have huge vacuums of nothingness between all the interesting things in our universe, they wouldn't be very efficient at creating local order. So here's my $64 answer to you of where, where, where technology or where intelligence goes. I don't think it goes to outer space as it gets smarter. I think it goes to inner space. And I think People who are looking at us going into outer space and intelligence going into outer space actually have it 180 degrees out of phase. We have to leave Earth, that's obvious. We know what, we already know five billion years maybe more we have, right? And then the Earth's gonna get heated up by uh, expanding red giant sun. So intelligence has gotta leave Earth. We think it's going into outer space currently, most, most futurists do. I think that's 180 degrees wrong. I think we're going into inner space. And the things we're figuring out about inner space today are just mind-blowing. I mean, you know, programmable matter. You've heard of graphene transistors, single electron transistors. Pretty soon we're going to be able to compute with one electron at a time. Right now our computers, they send huge clouds of electrons through every gate. It's hugely inefficient. You know how hot your laptop gets, right? We are, are on the, we're on the verge right now of computing with one electron at a time th across a gate. Fat-fingered early 21st century human beings computing with one electron at a time, creating seven qubit quantum computers, entangling photons so that when we unentangle them seven miles apart down a fiber optic cable, 
and get spin down on one, almost instantaneously, the other one is spin up. What does that tell you? That tells you that things at the quantum scale don't respect space and time. That is so weird, so interesting, and I think there's lots and lots of evidence. Things like the quantum space, things like black holes, things like um, these theories of the multiverse, right? string theories and M theories, that there's so much unbounded complexity there and potential that that's where we go. The Tinkler Institute is opening the, the dialogue. We have to give ourselves permission to discuss these things. If someone is figuring out a way to get press, to get us to discuss these things seriously, that is absolutely what we need to be doing. And everything that I just said is just my one single opinion, having studied these subjects. I would love to see what uh, James Sorowiecki calls the wisdom of crowds in this space. Because once you get the nice bell curve of all the possible thoughts, I think somewhere in that envelope is going to be the reality. As he says, when you, um, take a, when you take a guess as to how many jelly beans are in that jar, your guess is going to be plus or minus 20% as to how many there actually are. You get 10 of us cognitively diverse in a room and make that guess, it's going to be plus or minus 5%. And that's what the internet's going to give us. That's what publicizing these issues through groups like the Singularity Institute is going to give us. It's going to give us much better insight on the pieces of the AI puzzle that are the low-hanging fruit that are going to take us to the next step and surprise us. Because we want to open that newspaper every day and be surprised. I think so. Yeah, I think that's the nature of, of the universe. Is what. Um, Kurt Godel called computationally incomplete. No matter how complex your formological system, there's always questions that you can ask that cannot be proven or disproven from within that system. So you gotta design a new system. My optimism would be that there's these hidden factors. You can do, you can set up your wearable computer to filter whatever kind of reality you want to you. You can be a in a complete echo chamber cocoon when you get that technology and completely zoom off from reality. But most people I don't think are going to do that. They're going to do it enough to, to keep their culture, but they're going to be fully conscious of how those technologies interact with them. Look at the Amish. I love the Amish, one of my favorite cultures. They debate whether they want to use rubber bands. You can think about the power of that culture they can decide, is a rubber band taking away from my community? Of course, they use cell phones on their own terms. They use rubber bands on their own terms. Right? That's a really wonderful culture. I want that kind of culture to exist right past the singularity in its little bubble, like Spider Park Robinson says, this little Earth Park bubbles, where there's going to be deep nanotech surveillance on everybody to make sure they're not making nukes in their basement. But if they want to live that way, more power to them, man. I love it. Right? Because then there's more diversity, there's more ways that I can think and be. But you think of all those cultures that have successfully done that in the long term, and they snap back to reality to some degree. And so there's, there's, there's always seems to me real strong forces that pull people, even though they like to go off into those separate worlds, pull people back. And you know, the, I have this law of technology, it's my third law of technology. And it's that first generation technologies are usually dehumanizing you don't get the interface right. Um, and they're primitive. And they're the first time humans are using them. Second generation technologies are indifferent to humanity. So they're a wash, really. Some benefits and some negatives. And with luck, third generation technologies are net humanizing. And I think that's the way, for example, video games today. First generation, kids go off into their own space. They forget a lot of their social skills. We're just entering the second generation now where kids can use TeamSpeak and they can talk to each other and collaborate as a group to solve a complex problem. So there's some impressive aspects and plus there's some, simulated, there's some serious games where kids can actually you know, play chemistry simulations and maybe even learn chemistry you know, twice as fast as they would if they had to play with the nasty chemicals. And, and the simulations are realistic enough that they snap back to, to skills that they can transfer to the real world. But then there's all these negative effects still. So it's really, we're not even yet in the full second generation where you could say it's neutral, but we're getting close. 
think of a third generation where you're wearing the game with you everywhere, as you were mentioning earlier. You know, the, the uh, bird flies by, and your knowledge management system tells you, you want to know the calculus behind that? But I know you have an AP test in three weeks, and it's only going to take two minutes. I'll give it to you. And, and I promise you, you'll, you'll have it nailed. That kind of a world, you can imagine a kid who's so tuned in that you turn off the whole net, and they can be survivor man, right? And get food out of the ground for two weeks because they uploaded that little module. They can make change, which kids can't do today. They've lost that ability, right? Because we're still in first generation calculator you know, interactions. That kind of a world, the kids actually can be smarter than their parents were, never smarter than the machines, that's not possible, but smarter than their parents were at all the skills that they matter, that matter to them, when they turn the machines off. And that's a truly empowering world, because then you can deal with the machines on your own terms. But I do believe that in the long run, you're going to start, your, early, your model is correct, I believe, in the long run. In the long run, we won't be using words like trans transhumanism and separation of identity, and we're just going to start to feel like these things that are extensions of us. When your mom dies in 2050, you're not going to go to a tombstone to grieve. You're going to fire up digital mom. You're going to get all of her stories, all of her attitudes. You're going to be in some city in France where your grandmother was 100 years ago. She's going to whisper a little story to you through some digital scrapbook. It's not going to be your true grandma, but it's going to be close enough that you're going to feel like you're in all these places. And at some point, Digimom gets good enough and you get good enough that you start to feel like there really isn't much of a difference between my digital and my electronic self. And I think that successive approximation type of an AI, that's the one that I predict we're going to see. Now, there's other people at Sing Institute or, and at the summit who think we're going to see a very significant, what they call a hard takeoff. More power to them. I'm glad there are people out there doing that kind of work. I, I personally don't think we're going to see hard takeoffs except in these narrow areas that we've seen in the last 50 years. I could be wrong.